Welcome back to this last Global Networking Forum session of today, which is organized by our gold sponsor, Lockheed Martin. And it is focusing on enabling science and exploration, extending human presence from Earth to the Moon and beyond. But before we dive into the session, please enjoy this very nice video. Our purpose in this life is a precious gift. This gift is often waiting to be unearthed in the why of what we do and believe. Our purpose is found in the why of protecting what matters most. The town of Newcastle, Oklahoma, is giving credit to an early warning severe weather forecast system for saving countless lives. Sir, our satellite alerted us to an avalanche. It's imaging the area and tracking heat signatures of potential victims. Sending updates now. Our purpose is found in the why of connecting to each other around town and around the world. And the U.S. Space Force continues to modernize today's GPS satellite constellation with new, more powerful GPS-3 satellites. General, this is Air Force One. We will be connecting you to a secure line to the President shortly. Stand by, One. And our purpose is found in the why of exploring what lies beyond. NASA's Inside Lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the Red Planet. OSIRIS-REx completed a daring two-year mission, studying and collecting a pristine sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose a mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history. Yes, and now I just would like to remind you that also for this session you can engage in the discussion by submitting and rating questions on our Slido system, which you are already very well familiar with. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to the moderator of this session, Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund. Pascal, please. Well, thank you, Christian. And, uh, Dear delegates and uh, to the audience, of course, also which is online, welcome to the Global Networking Forum panel on the topic Enabling Science and Exploration, Extending Human Presence from Earth to the Moon and Beyond. So by addressing the challenges related to robotic and uh, human spaceflight in deep space, we expand science and technology and help foster international cooperation. It is the goal that NASA and its international partners uh, will reach the lunar surface together through the Artemis program. And it is through collaboration we expand our knowledge of the moon and our early solar system. We learn to live and explore on other worlds and also observe the universe from the unique vantage point of the moon. And this discussion today in this GNF session will provide an update from the industry perspective on Orion and the Artemis architecture, along uh, with the lunar surface capabilities that will enable us to conduct crucial scientific investigations and extend human presence beyond our home planet. So I would like uh, to introduce the panel members, and it's great because this is an all-female panel and, and the moderator, so it doesn't happen so often. So Carrie Timmons is Lockheed Martin's System Engineering Design and Integration Senior Manager for the Orion program. She leads a team of engineers working requirements and verification, mechanical and electric integration, and human system integration for the Artemis 1 and 2 missions that will support deep space exploration missions to the moon. 
She joined Lockheed Martin in 2004, and her previous job experience includes system engineering and technical leadership in support of design, development and test for Orion, military support programs and new business pursuits, including the human uh, lander system and the gateway habitat. So the second panelist is Lisa May. She is currently the chief technologist for Lockheed Martin's commercial and civil space advanced programs. Lisa leads technology strategy development in support of all market segments. And prior to assuming the chief technologist role, Lisa served as the deputy space exploration architect. Before joining Lockheed Martin, Lisa was the CEO of Murphy and Consulting. And before that, Lisa served at, head, at NASA headquarters, where she managed NASA's diverse portfolio of Mars missions and chaired the International Mars Exploration Working Group. Lisa was also the program executive for the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, the MAVEN mission, the Mars Technology Program, and Mars Sample Return. So let's get started. My first question goes uh, to Carrie. Plans are underway for NASA's Artemis mission. So could you tell us uh, about the steps from now uh, to take uh, the next humans to the moon? Thanks, Pascal. I'm so happy to be here today to get to talk to you about Orion. And I've brought a few pictures. Hopefully um, you can see those. The Orion program has just been a great development program, um, bringing, uh, we've, we've had the opportunity to develop technologies for missions that have never been attempted before. We've, uh, this program has brought the international community together with uh, contributions from um, many different nations and it's, it's ready to fly. So I'm not sure if this this is the right image. I was hoping for one with um, some of the Artemis spacecraft vehicles um, in build. Go to image two, please. There you go. Thank you. Um, so there you see on the upper left-hand corner, the Artemis One spacecraft. Um, that is in the multi-payload processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. Lockheed Martin handed this vehicle over to NASA Ground Systems earlier this year. And they are currently in the process of doing the commodity loading. So filling the propellant tanks, um, adding the coolant fluid, and even the logos. You see on the, the left side of the spacecraft there, you can barely see the, the NASA meatball logo. So really good progress there. From, from here, the vehicle will go to the launch abort system facility, where it will get integrated with the this crew and service module will get integrated with the launch abort system, which is a key safety element of the architecture. It can pull the crew to safety within milliseconds in the event of any anomalies during launch or ascent. So um, this is such a cool mission, a lot of firsts and new developments for the Artemis One mission. Will um, this flight will be the first time we get to demonstrate the integrated performance of the space launch system and the Orion vehicle um, as the Orion capsule will go 280,000 miles from Earth to the moon and then return the uh, capsule safely to Earth. So really neat mission and um, we're getting to do a lot of demonstrations. This, this vehicle has been designed at the very beginning with deep space exploration and crew safety in mind. And deep space exploration is very different than um, the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere that many LEO vehicles are designed for. And we have to consider, make strong considerations about radiation. So one of the uh, payloads for Artemis One is called Matryoshka Astrorad Radiation Experiment, or MARE. And this is so cool, another international contribution. Um, we are flying uh, the Astrorad radiation vest developed by Israeli company Stemrad. 
and it'll fly on a torso developed by the German Aerospace Company or Center. And uh, this will help us to characterize the radiation environment at the moon and develop mitigation techniques, techniques and protections to keep the crew safe in that environment. So really, really great mission and getting, looking forward to a flight later this year. Um, on the, the top right of the picture is the Artemis II spacecraft which is going to be the first uh, Orion spacecraft to carry crew. Um, so we'll have a crew of four going to the moon on this mission. You'll see the right picture is the crew module at the Operations and Checkout building at Kennedy Space Center. Right now we're welding the propulsion tubing on and doing proof and leak. And we're also installing the avionics boxes and harnessing as they become available. So really far along in the build there. And that center picture there um, highlights our international collaboration. That's the European service module being built up by Airbus. And the European service module is another key aspect of the overall Orion architecture. It contains the powerful propulsion systems. It can store up to 20,000 pounds of propellant. And it also stores all of the crew commodities, the water, the breathable air. So really, really important um, to the mission. And uh, the, the fun part, it, it stores, um, there's a place to capture payloads also. So the Artemis II mission will actually fly an optical comm demonstration payload. So well underway on the buildup and testing of Artemis II. The bottom left there is our Artemis III spacecraft in build at the shoot assembly facility in Louisiana. So there you see some key structural components being welded together, getting ready for that mission. That's actually the vehicle that will take crew for the 2024 uh, human landing. So. Another exciting mission for us. And see Artemis IV, we're um, working with our suppliers and have started machining on key, key structural components for that vehicle as well. So lots of, lots of stuff in work, really exciting. Looking forward to uh, recurring missions and more regular flights. Thank you very so much. That's, that's where we are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, I think not um, a lot of people and scientists and engineers have heard about Artemis 1 and, and 2 and 3, but not about 4. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate a little bit uh, just on this last uh, picture? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for Artemis 1 and 2, we were deep in the development and putting the designs together and the concepts for the very first time. As we trans Artemis 3 and 4, we go to more of a production mentality where it's build to print. And now we're starting to focus on how do we make that build more efficient? What technologies can we introduce to facilitate that, such as 3D printing or augmented and virtual reality to facilitate the buildup? So, the Artemis IV mission um, is several years out, and we're just getting started with the machining of the components, but it'll likely be a mission either with HLS or to the Gateway, um, again, bringing crew to explore beyond LEO. Okay, and, and, and Carrie, you um, uh, talked about Orion, and uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the mission duration? of Orion um, and um, how much can Orion actually handle and talk a little bit more about how astronauts are really protected in deep space. You mentioned, of course, the radiation risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'll start with Artemis 1 because that's the, the next one, as I mentioned, a launch coming up later this year. That will be a four to six week mission. And I know that sounds like a broad range, but uh, orbital mechanics is interesting that way, depending on what day we launch and um, whether we want to run um, at night in the dark or in the daylight, we'll set the actual duration of that mission. So four to six weeks for the Artemis One mission, 
Artemis II is, as I mentioned, the first crewed mission. And so that one will be eight to 10 days and it'll do a lunar, fly lunar flyby and then return the crew safely to Earth. Um, as I mentioned, Orion has been designed from day one with the crew safety and this deep space environment in mind, and radiation is a key aspect of that. Um, mass distribution is one of the most important things you can do to protect the crew from that radiation environment, and so mass has been strategically placed around the vehicle to provide that. that. Also, the um, internal crew cabin is reconfigurable to develop uh, or to put together a storm shelter in the event of a radiation event to protect the crew. So some key features there for Orion. Um, as far as you asked about the full capabilities, Orion can support up to thousand day missions limited only by commodities. So what that means is that the avionics and the electrical systems have the reliability and redundancy to support these very long duration missions. When you think about a thousand day mission, that's like going all the way to Mars and back. So um, that also applies to the heat shield design. Um, when you're returning with um, velocities from Mars, uh, you get a lot hotter on the, the re-entry. So the, the heat shield has been designed to withstand temperatures up to almost 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it keeps the structure just inches below that at a cool 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you very much, Carrie. These are really very interesting key features, yeah, which uh, um, uh, are well discussed, you know. Uh, because uh, you know, you of course you look always at the at the, at the mission, but um, these are really details which uh, I think uh, nobody is so familiar with. That's really interesting. Now uh, uh, let me uh, uh, jump to to Lisa. We are all looking forward to the tremendous milestone of having humans um, on the moon once again. And uh, Lisa, could you describe us what a sustained presence on the moon, what might it look like? Thank you, Pascal. Uh, we are really looking forward to sending humans back to the moon. And presence on the moon enables scientific exploration, enables technology demonstration, and the identification of resources as well as the use of those resources to support human presence. And when we think about the first human missions, one of the key technologies and one of the key enablers is gonna be mobility. And I was uh, listening to the previous panel and uh, about uh, Dr. Squire landing pads and infrastructure needs. And one of the things that is really important is if we are not yet at a capability of building landing pads, we will absolutely have to land things separate from each other. And we'll have to have mobility to link up our assets and elements on the surface of the moon. And mobility, as we learned at Mars with the Mars Exploration Rovers, mobility is so key to doing scientific exploration at the moon. Apollo explored less than 5% of the moon's surface, and missions like Elo and Grail that orbit the moon have taught us a lot about the history and composition of the moon and its topography. But there is so much more to learn about the history of the solar system, the history of the moon itself, and, as I mentioned, identification of potential resources for human use. So we are going to want to start our exploration of the moon with a mobile presence with rovers large and small, and that will let us uh, identify where humans really want to put down roots on the moon. There are so many exciting and interesting landing sites and so many uh, areas that hold promise. So having mobility is going to be probably the most important first step. And following that, wherever humans go in the world or the solar system, you gotta have uh, power your power, your phone, your car, your um, capabilities to actually exist. Uh, so power, whether it's solar arrays or nuclear fission generated, reactor generated power, fuel cells, uh, or some of the RTGs that are more common than the deep space planetary missions, 
all of those sources of power will be used by humans to charge their rovers, uh, power the habitats, and um, enable uh, use in situ re resource utilization. So I mean, if you can think on the scale of um, charging the small rover, going all the way up to uh, using uh, essentially heavy equipment to extract enough uh, hydrogen and oxygen for those propellers John Connolly was talking about in the last panel. And so power is probably the most important first thing after mobility. And of course, telecommunications, communications technology and navigation. There's no GPS at the moon and everything on the moon will have to talk to each other and talk back to earth and talk to the gateway. And so the communications um, up to, you can imagine a, a rover telling a charging station that it's coming to charge itself and the charging station helping the rover navigate to, to its uh, site to plug in. Um, much the way a lot of EVs do now on Earth, although hopefully we'll get a lot of uh, compatibility between all of the rivers and devices. So we see the integration of power and communications as well. And one other technology that's not necessarily obvious, but is very important to future exploration is cryogenic fluid management. Cryogenics, uh, cryogenic, particularly liquid hydrogen, is critical to future transportation. And um, again, referencing John Connolly's propellant depots, we'll be wanting to use cryogenic hydrogen and we'll be wanting to generate it from the water that's found on the moon. So having that ability to uh, propel spacecraft from the surface to orbit or to have refueling depots in orbit around the moon is going to be a final technology that, that really is the foundation. So we have mobility, power, telecommunications, and then propellant cryogenic fluids. And we're actually sending a cryogenic demonstration mission in 2024 to uh, really mature and demonstrate some of the key technologies for that, including storage and transfer of cryogenic hydrogen on orbit. So there's a, a lot of uh, technology development and, uh, and I think the lunar future is of course very exciting. Uh, here at this conference, the Global Space Exploration Conference here in St. Petersburg, there's a lot of discussion about uh, lunar exploration and lunar surface stations and international cooperation. So it's an exciting topic. And uh, so how will it, uh, um, this lunar exploration actually prepare for expansion of human presence beyond the moon later on when we are actually looking uh, to go forward to Mars? So I, I'll start and I'll hand over to Carrie to talk about Mars Base Camp, but I'll start with some of the basics of what we're looking at right now um, with the things that we have in hand, like the International Space Station and the Gateway, which is going to be completed soon in time for human exploration of the moon. And we will use those venues, we'll use the space station, continue to use it, we'll continue, we will use the Gateway for experiments and demonstrations of capabilities and providing data for what it's like to, um, for humans to be in space, in partial gravity for long durations. Uh, we'll also be using those venues for demonstrating key technologies, including life support. And then the surface of the moon, it is not only rich to itself for the scientific exploration and the human presence, but it's a really key place where we can demonstrate things like the in-situ resource utilization and other infrastructure that we will need in order to go on beyond to Mars. Carrie, you wanna talk a little, we saw in the video, we saw Mars Base Camp and it's really Orion based. So Carrie, give us a little more about that. It is Orion based and the lunar campaign is so exciting. There's just so many aspects of it. Um, to me, it's especially exciting when you think of it as just the, the first step on a much longer journey. And Mars Base Camp is Lockheed Martin's vision for that.
that journey of taking humans to Mars in about a decade. That's kind of our vision and timeline for it. And it's a, it's a relatively simple concept. Let's transport astronauts from the Earth via the moon and the gateway to an orbiting science lab around Mars. Um, the crew aboard this orbiting platform can do real-time and near real-time science experiments. They can analyze the soil and rocks um, sample returns from Mars. They can um, scout out the perfect landing site for putting humans on the surface in about the, the 2030s. So um, lots of opportunities when you have humans up close to Mars to have that real-time decision-making. Um, so I think a lot of benefits to that. And it's really, Mars Base Camp is a technology roadmap um, to help to support NASA's vision and journey to getting to Mars. So we envision it as a, as a NASA-led endeavor with support from their international and commercial partners. And um, one of the key aspects is, is leveraging the technologies that have been developed under Orion and the SLS and the, even the Next Step programs. So um, I don't know, I may be biased, but uh, I think there's a lot from the advanced avionics, the software, the fault management developed for Orion that could be used to accelerate the, the development of this orbiting platform. Right, and we've, we've planned Orion that way, right? I mean, as you were saying earlier, that Orion is intended to go beyond. And that has been incorporated from the very first steps. And some of what I was talking about, you know, about using mobility on the surface of the moon to find where to put down roots and other capabilities that we're going to build on the moon, we can do some of that from orbit at Mars. We can do that, you know, right now we have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter finding landing sites and um, continuing to do scientific imaging. But with humans there, we can have even more rich information about where we would want to put down a Mars surface camp. And um, the other thing we can do from the moon is we can practice sorties. We can practice the cadence and the operations that are required to go from orbit to a different planetary surface and back to orbit again. That sounds very straightforward, but I think we'll learn an awful lot at the moon from the Artemis program about what we need to do when we get to Mars. Totally agree. And um, I've mentioned safety a lot. It's definitely a priority for us. And doing those practice missions at the moon a lot closer to home um, is really prudent and, and practical in developing an architecture that keeps the crew safe on those long duration missions. What is a, yeah, no, a really fascinating, uh, it's a really fascinating outlook, you know, also into the future. Uh, it looks quite um, uh, tense, you know, in a decade, you know, uh, uh, with a Mars space camp, you know, to uh, uh, send humans actually to Mars. Uh, that's, that's really very ambitious. And um, uh, while I, I, I want to, um, to address some questions, I actually have a, a few uh, small ones, but I want to go to the audience questions before. Um, uh, I think sometimes it's quite difficult for, for the audience because there's a lot of press releases. What are actually the exact, more or less, or anticipated dates of the different Artemis missions? Yeah? One, two, three, and if you could help us a little bit um, approximately to understand, because everybody uh, knows that the Artemis program is, you know, a long-term program with also a goal, you know, to go to uh, to, to Mars later on. Uh -oh. Uh, and uh, we have some uh, questions from the audience which would actually like to know a little bit more about the time scale of the different missions. Sure, I, I'd have to um, maybe defer some of that question to the, the NASA websites, but um, Artemis 1 is the near-term mission. Um, Looking forward to a launch later this year. I know there's recent um, press releases on the stacking of the SLS at Kennedy Space Center. I talked a little bit about the final processing and commodity loading of the 
of the Orion spacecraft. So um, all of that's leading toward a launch later this year. Um, the Artemis II spacecraft, we showed you the pictures of it getting built up. The, uh, there's a lot of external systems to us that are involved in that launch as well with the NASA ground systems and the SLS. And so all of those are working together toward a launch um, probably in the 2024 time, 2023 time frame. And then we're looking to do about um, uh, once a year launches following that. And whenever NASA is ready to send humans, we're ready to go. We're ready to go. And that's it. It's a tough schedule. We also always know that you know sometimes uh, those things shift. You know, uh, but uh, it's it's quite important because it's such a long-term program to understand a little bit the sequence. Um, there is another question um, uh, from the audience, uh, which asks if Lockheed Martin uh, is still planning to reuse Orion capsules, and if yes, um, when is that expected to be done? Yeah, that's a great question. I talked a little bit about how we're transitioning from a development mindset to a production mindset, and really getting those build and sustainment costs down, and reuse is a key aspect of that for us. So starting with the um, some components actually from this one and two missions will be reused on subsequent missions, but really the Artemis III spacecraft is the first one that we plan to um, reuse. So when it's, it comes back to Earth, we'll um, clean it, refurb it, check everything out, and get it ready for the next launch. Um, so starting with Artemis III, we'll begin the full reuse campaign for Orion. Okay, so I have, um, I have a question because we are here at a conference of uh, International Space Cooperation. And uh, um, it's, it's a little bit of a question. You are, of course, working with international partners, also industry partners. And uh, how, how does that go? How is, uh, how um, would you say solid and uh, comfortable is the international cooperation on such uh, really complex and long-term mission? That's a great question. You know, we are very experienced with international collaboration on deep space missions. Our planetary science missions have always included international collaboration. And so we're incorporating those practices in, in, in including international partners as we go uh, on for human exploration, particularly in the scientific exploration area where we have been working with the science community for decades on missions like OSIRIS-REx and InSight that you saw in the video. Uh, so not only do we have international collaboration, for example, with the European Space Service module and um, experiments on Artemis One, we have a very long history of global cooperation in our commercial civil space program. Uh, there's, there's one question uh, of, of from the audience where I think I will modify it a little bit. Um, I, I think it's what is meant by it uh, is that uh, if we are, for instance, if uh, Orion is going to Mars, uh, will it be upgraded? Will it have to be enlarged uh, for, for really going into deep space further on to Mars? And um, uh, what, what would that look like and uh, how uh, would uh, this be technically feasible? Yeah, our Mars base, base camp concept is actually much larger than Orion. It does include the Orion element and a lot of what we call Orion inside the command deck aspects of Orion, utilizing the avionics and software. Um, but it'd be a, a much larger vehicle um, with a lot of redundancy. And we do have some images online. I don't know that we brought any today, but um, it's essentially having um, a larger area for living and science um, with habitats on each end surrounded by a tank farm. Again, talking about using that mass as radiation protection um, and 
we'll need a lot more um, commodities, propellant, water, breathable air. So we need a lot of room and storage for those tanks. Um, and then obviously Orion um, as both a, a storm shelter and a safety element and then um, propulsion elements um, as well as uh, large commercial solar arrays to augment and provide power to the overall spacecraft. So yes, it is, it is bigger than Orion. A lot of the avionics um, have been designed with the right reliability and redundancy that we can leverage into a vehicle like this, but it would need to be larger just to provide the crew that volume and the living space that they need um, on a mission that long. Yeah, I have two things to add to that, Carrie. One is that it is a long mission. It's a long way to Mars. And the crew will need that additional volume in order to do science, as you mentioned, because they'll have the opportunity to do that science on the way. They mm -hmm. will have the opportunity not just to do science and exploration from orbit at Mars, but along the way, they'll be able to conduct experiments on human response to the environment and um, there are a lot of groups right now looking at what will the crew do in transit, not just at Mars and when they get back. And the other thing is, is we're up there. I mean, it, uh, it, it's sort of almost upon us. And so this fall, we'll have more information. We're working on, on sort of looking at that now that Orion is the first one is, well, the Artemis One Orion is delivered and the others are being built. Uh, we're we're going to be having some exciting uh, new looks at how that exactly would take place. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think, um, of course, uh, we are thinking about the future. And if there is such a complex endeavor, uh, technology never ends. You know, you will always... Uh, go deeper and uh, build larger mission. And we know that uh, if we go to Mars, we will really heavily have to protect humans uh, from, from radiation. We know that from the recent data. So it is a technological uh, challenge. I have uh, um, one a little bit more scientific question also. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Kerry, also the Mars Base Camp of Lockheed Martin Vision. And um, um, of course, there is a lot of uh, ideas, a lot of technology advancement. And, uh, but there is also a, a program right now. Uh, we have just had a fantastic panel on uh, perseverance, uh, science and technology, uh, which is happening now, how samples actually will be collected in order to be brought back by a Mars sample return mission. So how strongly is the Mars Base Camp vision uh, and technology development connected to uh, the NASA science and technology program um, uh, or the roadmap um, of uh, exploring Mars? So one of the ways I like to think about it is we're science enablers. And uh, you know, NASA's program to bring Mars samples back in, with the last element launching in 2031 is about as exciting a thing as I can think of having spent eight years working that myself. Um, and so the program of record you know, for bringing samples back from Mars includes collection and return of pristine samples that would be uh, individually curated and returned and kept from being contaminated and, um, and also being kept in containment here at Earth. And then you know, from that, as we move forward, we can start looking at how humans can enhance what we've learned uh, from samples that come back and uh, what kind of human geologists we will follow our robotic ones. And we're also looking at robotic partners for our human geologists once they are on the surface of the moon and of Mars. That's exactly right. We're science enablers, right? We don't 
want to um, continue to develop the, the spacecraft. We want to leverage the investments we've already made and take these technologies on the next phase of our journey and exploration. So let's use um, this technology and these investments that have been developed for these programs um, that are now ready to fly, ready to do recurring missions that are well along the way in the build process and enable these um, scientific explorations and studies of the, the sample returns. And, and if we could do it with the uh, humans there and not have to wait for the sample return to come all the way back to Earth, like we're planning for the current missions, um, you can get some real-time insight into what the next mission should be and, and turn those around quicker. And we can pick the samples that have to come back because we will want to curate them and look at them for decades to come. Yeah. a next generation panel uh, on the first day here at the Global Space Exploration Conference. There were, I think, uh, 350 um, young professionals, and they have been talking a lot about sustainability and also con forward contamination, uh, protecting the moon. They have even uh, written um, um, a, a paper to the United Nations. And uh, so it's my question, uh, when you are, you know, uh, working on these uh, technologies, bringing humans uh, to the moon, but also further on uh, to Mars, um, uh, is the industry actually really well connected to um, bodies like the United Nations or the Planetary Protection Panel of uh, COSPA and well informed uh, how uh, actually to protect, you know, um, uh, uh, the moon and the Mars uh, from uh, too harsh environmental um, uh, damage uh, through all those missions which are coming. Are you actually having discussions? Do you have interactions with uh, bodies which actually uh, deal with that? That seemed to be um, a very important topic on Monday here with our 350 young professionals to look forward to a susta to sustainable space. <laughs> First, Pascal, before we answer that question, I, I know you as well um, I have been a mentor in the um, pilot program for the IAF Launchpad Mentorum, and what a fabulous experience that has been. So I, I wanted to thank IAF for that opportunity. And I, I believe, Pascal, you also have been a mentor in that program, and it's been absolutely terrific. And I have a couple of thoughts on this, uh, and so I'll try to sort them out. First of all, planetary protection is a requirement, and we are very, very good at identifying and meeting and verifying that we will meet requirements to prevent contamination to, of, of other planetary bodies or prevent contamination of Earth. I mean, we are very experienced in, um, we've been part of every NASA Mars mission. We've been part of every NASA sample return mission. And so we're extremely experienced in the existing requirements and we are engaged with UN, COPE US and all of the other organizations that will, um, and Coast Bar that will be setting the requirements when humans go. So we're, we're part of that conversation and we're very experienced in, in managing those requirements. Another thing that has actually recently come to our attention is um, the topic of waste management and I, mean sort of trash uh, and reuse and recycling. The efficient use of resources that we take with us includes efficient reuse. And that is uh, uh, something that has been identified from work on the International Space Station as something we'll need to be paying attention to as we go forward to Gateway, the Moon, and Mars. And repurposing, reusing, and recycling are going to be very important for our efficiency when we get somewhere, as well as the meeting the requirements and the agreements regarding um, protecting the moon and Mars. Absolutely. The only thing I can add on to that is a very, very good response um, is that um, the, the Gateway and ISS are two great um, proving and test platforms for us to help mature that, uh, particularly the environmental control and life support systems to be able to 
create a really closed environment to reuse and recycle the the water, the human sweat out of the air, just making it a clean environment and also everything that's um, reusable. We can't, there's, there's no Walmart to stop and pick up the extra bottle of water at on the way to the moon or to Mars. So we need to be really careful and conscientious with those resources for our own benefit. And as Lisa mentioned, the requirements to um, keep both the planets um, clean and pure and um, the earth the same way. I think this is really very reassuring. And I, I, I just, um, uh, really stayed on this topic because it seemed to have been a really dominant topic um, here um, at um, the Space Exploration Conference in St. Petersburg. We had also in other sessions, we had a lot of questions um, uh, about, you know, the topic of sustainability, uh, space debris, you know, what we are doing to the moon. And, and so I think it is very reassuring that you are actually really taking care of that, that you are thought about that, that you have a concept uh, for, for space sustainability. And it was also actually discussed this topic today in the Heads of Space Agency panel. So that seems to be in particular the younger generation, you know, which are the future space leaders, uh, seem to be very concerned. And I, I just wanted to convey that, you know, from, uh, fr from this conference. Um, so we are coming slowly uh, to, the, to the end. We have uh, still a few minutes, and, and I think there, um, there is always this, you know, philosophical question: um, uh, How do we actually explain society? How much is society involved that we are actually really, you know, um, uh, have humans uh, on the moon, uh, probably in the very, very near, near future? that uh, this will be a regular task, that there will be human landers, uh, which would shuttle uh, humans uh, force and back, probably to the, uh, the, uh, the gateway, that we will probably have an international lunar research station that we move on, you know, further into space, to Mars, uh, bringing humans where we still, I think, have a lot of, uh, I would say, tech technical and medical issues to solve before that happens. But um, the space uh, exploration sector is really exploding and extremely dynamic. And um, uh, there are so many missions. And we see that here also at this, this conference, we just had a briefing from <clears throat> 14 heads of space agencies or also um, uh, large uh, space corporations and about their plans. And it's really enormously exciting, yeah? It's, it's not only Moon and Mars, it's even Venus. And, um, but uh, bringing humans, you know, to the Moon and then further on to Mars is always something which um, I think um, has a component where uh, it has to be conveyed to society and we have to win society over uh, being interested. And there might be also, um, you know, negative opinions about, um, are you um, providing videos? Are you doing outreach? Uh, how do you deal with this subject of uh, human exploration, near-term human exploration, will, which will be, you know, apart from the space station, uh, uh, it has been a while. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and there, there's a lot in that question, Pascal, but I think if we boil it down to its essence, that a few people will go to the moon out of all of the people here on Earth. And fewer for the foreseeable future would go to Mars. But we're all going. I, mean, I talked about communications infrastructure. It's not just important to operate machinery. It's not just important to have the crew talk to their um, ground systems, uh, their ground crew here on Earth. It's important for all of us to be able to go along, uh, for all of us to participate in the explorations and the discovery that, that we are going to make. And then all of it really does benefit us back here on Earth, probably in ways we can't predict right now. But certainly the conversation we just had about reuse, for example, is going to yield the technologies and capabilities we can use to improve life here on Earth. Likewise, life support and highly efficient power systems 
that can also be uh, incorporated into earth-based uh, power plants and, and used here for our benefits. So I, I feel like there's um, a lot of emphasis on what's happening out there, but we're all gonna go. We're all gonna go along. It's, it's not just the few people who, who uh, get on top of the rocket and go. Yeah, I think that um, part of the human experience is this need, this craving for adventure, whether you get to do it personally or whether you live vicariously through someone else. And um, watching these astronauts and living through their experiences and, and hearing about what they're doing and what, the, what sacrifices they make to make this possible, what everyone in industry is contributing to um, this endeavor. It just is, it's a global effort um, to explore beyond our planet. And it's just, there's, a, there's an aspect of adventure, excitement, unknown. Um, there's, there's only a few places left to really explore. And, and that unknown just gets gets creativity and curiosity and um, really, really invokes and um, invigorates the, the human condition, I think. Yeah, I think it's, it's great that also industry uh, you know, sees that uh, you have really to convey to so society the benefits, you know, of new technologies, but also of, you know, exploring the unknown. And I think we all have to do this outreach uh, in order to explain to society that this is uh, really an incredible journey uh, ahead. So uh, we have just a very, very little time left. I wanted to say it was um, really a wonderful time, a wonderful chat. You are sitting so comfortably here um, uh, in, 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 uh, um, at Lockheed Martin, I guess. Yeah? And um, uh, we want to really thank you um, it uh, has been a pleasure to see the perspectives of the industry of such an incredible uh, long-term mission and very complex mission, and you made it really easy to understand uh, the different steps uh, and uh, that it is really a very, very large-scale and interesting endeavor. And I wanted to give you maybe a, a, a minute, uh, each of you or together, where you could uh, still, uh, you know, uh, make a pitch <laughs> and say goodbye to us. <laughs> it has been a pleasure being here today and getting to speak to you all about Orion and Lockheed Martin's vision for lunar and Mars campaigns and just appreciate the opportunity to um, express where we are today and the excitement we have with the, the development nearing completion and being ready to fly regular recurring missions and um, get on to exploration. I would like for the opportunity to, to convey our progress and our plans and our enthusiasm. It's uh, important to us every day here at Lockheed Martin. And uh, I would also really, I'm really looking forward to being there in person next year. Uh, it is, uh, we regret that we are, we are happy to be together, but we regret that we aren't together with you, Pascal. And I am very much looking forward to our future opportunities to have conversations with everyone in the same room. Dear Carrie and Lisa, we thank you very much for this really, really comfortable conversation and very informative. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all the audience and um, everybody online who has actually sent us questions. And you know that this Global Networking Forum panel will be online at the IAF website and can be, uh, you know, streamed at any time and uh, day and night, <laughs> uh, you know, from all over the world. Um, so a lot of people will have still the possibility uh, to see that. Uh, Carrie and Lisa, thank you very much uh, from St. Petersburg, and uh, we hope we see you in Dubai. Thank you very much, Pascal, for this great moderation, and of course to Lisa and Carrie for joining us for this session. Uh, now, uh, 
Oh, the IF President, Pascal Ehrenfreund, and Director General of Oscosmos, uh, Mr. Rogozin, will join a press briefing in Hall 11. You can very comfortably follow the press briefing also on the screens in this hall and outside in the Catherine Hall. And we would like to now already invite you to join us for the great welcome reception, which will start at 1900 right after the press conference outside in the Catherine Hall. Thank you for being with us and see you later at the welcome reception. <laughs>